Okay, so the, the disease states that we have with the thyroid is we have a low functioning thyroid, which is going to be hypothyroidism. And this is an example of a goiter. And when you have a low functioning thyroid, you have hypertrophy that occurs to cause a uh, increase in the, the, the function of the thyroidism, or, or I'm sorry, of the, of the thyroid. So with hypothyroidism, we experience low T3, T4, either concentration or we're going to find out because of receptor issues. So we end up with a low T3, T4 response. So the causes may include a non-responsive tissue, non-responsive target tissue for things like receptor damage, so the receptors just don't respond to T3 or T4. We might experience hypothyroidism because we have issues with the pituitary gland that causes the thyroid to respond. Pituitary defect or even a low thyroid response to TRH. So this is our most common, uh, what we would say, etiology or cause of hypothyroidism. Within the pituitary, that defect, a lot of times it's a failure to make TSH beta chain. then we end up with no or low functioning TSH. We don't have the ability to stimulate the thyroid, then we run into inability to produce T3, T4 effectively. Another cause of hypothyroidism is we may produce hormones normally, but remember that T4 is produced in higher concentrations than T3, but it's converted in the body or the target tissue to T4 to T3. And there's a possibility that we have a failure to go through that conversionary, conversionary process. A failure to convert a T4, which is the most commonly produced at the highest concentration from, produced from the thyroid and it's converted to T3, which is the most physiologically potent. This is known as low T3 syndrome. A fourth cause for hypothyroidism is centered around the dietary intake of iodine. Low intake of dietary iodine, don't move iodine into the thyroid, so we get chicken juice and dip and put together T3 and T4. When you have low levels of dietary iodine, the goiter that develops here is called an endemic goiter. mother who has an endemic goiter during pregnancy can actually cause her offspring to develop endemic cretinism.
instead of those issues that are surrounded with street or drug number, etc. Now, this is not near as common in the United States anymore. We iodize our salt. Most of us have plenty of salt we take, so we have really no problems with um, collecting enough iodine in our diet. On the other side of the spectrum is hyperthyroid. Hyperthyroidism, um, several other causes here as well. One disease that's prominent, uh, a prominent display of hyperthyroidism is Graves' disease. This is an example of what Graves' disease look like or what, what can manifest because of Graves' disease. So you notice that the thyroid actually enlarges, becomes bigger. And then with Graves' disease, uh, with that overproduction of thyroid hormones, you get this enlargement of the thyroid and then the symptoms. And this, this is called ex, ex, exothelmus. Bulging eyes, eyes basically coming out of uh, out of the socket. So you can see that you actually have space. This would be a CT scan. You have space that develops through this process. So the eye is an eye that protrudes from, from the socket. With Graves' disease, the hyperthyroidism, uh, you have an antibody that's produced. That has TSH like characteristics or activity. So you start producing this protein, this antibody, that stimulates the thyroid, and the thyroid overproduces to treat the disease. We also, with hyperthyroidism, can develop ectopic TSH. Uh, and in this idea of ectopic TH, uh, TSH production, um, <clears throat> a lot of times what happens is the gonadotrophs, uh, gonadotrophs, right? So this is the cells that produce the gonadotrophins. Those gonadotrophs begin to produce TSH. Instead of producing Instead of producing LH and FSH. And so now we start to target those gonadotrophs that also generate TSH. And the biggest issue here is because of the gonadotrophs' normal negative feedback loop, that doesn't get disrupted. We don't have a way to turn off this TSH stimulation uh, or the stimulation uh, to produce TSH. And so we lose the negative feedback loop. So TSH levels are high, the thyroid is stimulated. Yes. Yeah, he was talking about that. Wow. Did he direct that at you? No, I'm not. I don't have to I'm not really paying attention to that conversation too much. <laughs> we can also have a carcinoma <laughs> where the tumor produces TSH. And that carcinoma, that cancer, cancerous uh, tumor could be not just associated with the thyroid. It could be anywhere. In fact, most of the time it is not a thyroid carcinoma. And then there's um, also just 
elevated TSH production due to the goiter, and then this particular goiter is called a toxic goiter. Whereas when we have the low iodine diode, Toxic for hyper, endemic for hypo. All right. Um, any questions over thyroid? We're ready to do some really fun stuff now. Start talking about reproductive hormones. Smile, Bree. So this is, we're about to start chapter, chapter 16, and the way that this is all divided up, 16 is reproductive hormones and development, 17 is reproductive system in the male, 18 and 19 is reproductive system in females. Okay? So we're going to start out with chapter number 16. So I want to talk about development uh, and basically start from conception and then work our way through embryogenesis, ketogenesis, into, into birth. So in humans and other mammal species, the female sex gamete is the egg and it contains a X chromosome. Whereas the male sex gamete, the sperm, can contain either an X or a Y chromosome. And so when we have this combination of that fertilization of an egg and a sperm, we have a couple different uh, ways in which X's and Y's can be combined. And we use that combination to determine genetic sex of the individual. And the genetic sex of the individual in humans and other mammal species will either be homogametic, where the homogametic sex is female with an XX combination, or heterogametic. male and an XY combination. So XX female, XY male. So that's what we refer to as genetic sex. The next step in progression here is to develop and determine what would be referred to as gonadal sex. The, term, the determination of gonadal sex is based off of what type of gonad develops. What type of gonads develop. And under very normal circumstances, it's very, very rare for anything else to happen, especially in the human population, albeit there is a very small percentage of individuals where the gametic sex determines a different gonadal sex. But we're talking about a very, very tiny portion of the population. So the female with the XX homogametic sex typically differentiates the undifferentiated gonad into an ovary. 
So female XX produce ovaries, and then males XY produce testes. Then from here, based off of the comedic sex driving the gonadal sex, gonadal sex then drives the phenotypic sex. Right, the phenotypic sex, and this is the, this idea. idea of outward expression, the de facto standard or the, the, the main standard for outward expression is whether or not you have a testicular, uh, a testicular tissue contained within a scrotum. If you have testicular tissue contained within a scrotum, your outward expression is that you are male. If you do not, then your outward expression is that you are female. And so if you kind of think through a lot of the conversations that are going on with gender fluidity and your chosen pronouns, that just because I have testes doesn't make me male, it's completely unscientific. There's a very natural progression here for the majority of the humans on the planet right now. Yes, are there occasionally individuals who will have the female XX composition and they end up producing testes? Occasionally. But in those cases, even though they're an XX, which homogeneously would say that they're female, their outward expression is that they produce testes. And so they actually develop as a male. But again, we're talking about a very small portion of the human population. So how is we how, how do we actually program can develop, or how are we programmed to develop a specific gonadal sex? That's what I want to talk about now. I want to talk about the anatomy, the morphology, and the physiology here in the endocrinology. And so, during development, after conception, one of the structures that begins to develop is what's known as the undifferentiated. The undifferentiated gonads. So these, this is a mass of tissue that begins to develop, and it develops in two different regions. Those two different regions are going to be the medulla and the cortical tissue. We have the medulla and the cortex. Now, with development, that fertilization, by the way, is where you can determine the sex of an individual, right? For the majority of, of humans in the human population, through all of history, you could determine if you had an ability to observe the chromosomes, if you could observe that there was an XY chromosome or an XX chromosome, at that point, at the point of conception, is when you can determine sex of an individual. You don't have to wait until they begin to develop characteristics that you determine it by their genetic composition. And you're going to be successful almost 100% of the time. So we begin to develop this undifferentiated gonad, and there are suppression effects that are going to drive which of these two regions becomes the prominent tissue of development? Okay. So for male development, male development, you have medullary suppression of the cortical. 
vertical region. So even though it's an undifferentiated, I, I guess, and let me back up a little bit. Okay. This stuff is, is, is in context to today's conversation about gender fluidity and about the science behind gender and sex and all of that. This is a critical scientific understanding that, that you really need to have a basis on uh, in order to, to understand why gender fluidity is so so absolutely asinine. Okay. One of the things that you'll hear with gender fluidity and with transgenderism and this idea of sexual reassignment is that the male reproductive system is just an inside out version of the female reproductive system. And the female reproductive system is just an inside out version of the male reproductive system. It couldn't be further from the truth. What we're going to be discovering here as we go through this is actually these two organ systems develop from completely different tissues. So you start out with this undifferentiated gonad. And it's kind of like, oh, okay, so that undifferentiated gonad either becomes an ovary or a or a test. But really it's not entirely that simple because you have these two regions, the medullary region and the cortical region. And then you have these suppression effects. And so the tissue that actually develops as testicular tissue is going to be the medullary region. Whereas the cortical region is going to suppress the medullary region in females and will develop as the ovarian tissue. So this idea that they're just inside out or from the same tissue is completely false. And I've actually even heard individuals on this campus talk about they're just inside out of each other. Could be further from the truth. They're developing from two different sets of tissue. And we're actually going to get into the into the tubular structures in the in the reproductive system. And there's two different duct systems that initially start to develop, and then one of them regresses for females and the other one regresses for males. And so the tissue of development is completely separated as well. So it's not just simply, oh, you really could have been just male if it had just folded out the, the, the other way, or it could have been female if it had just folded in the other way. Um, okay, so we have suppression effects for male development, medullary suppression of the cortical tissue, and then for female development, female development, suppression of the medullary tissue. Okay. So these suppression effects are going to drive which of these layers of undifferentiated uh, gonad begin to develop. Okay, so now let's talk about how we actually set these suppression effects and how we drive each of these different layers of the tissue to undergo their differentiation. So this is an endocrine regulation. And what I want to do is I want to give you a figure. I'm here to, I'm here to draw this out. So is everybody good here? Have all of that. So if we start from if we start from the undifferentiated gonad, the options are for the cortical tissue to develop as an ovary as we suppress the medullary tissue. Turns out this is actually the default program. Now why would this be the default program? Well this is the default program because the development, uh, environment of development is, is female. That's the default. You have high levels of estrogen, progesterone, and other female sex characteristics. And so the, the, the default for differentiation is to suppress the uh, cortical, um, to suppress the medullary region and to develop the cortical of this undifferentiated gonad. For males, to go towards testicular tissue and to have that medullary suppression of the cortical region, you need to have the presence of what's known as the SRY. SRY. Okay. So what exactly is the SRY gene? 
Well, the SRY gene is found on the Y chromosome. And the Y chromosome actually carries very few. It's a very low-density gene-containing chromosome, but it contains one gene in particular that's important. It's called the SRY gene, and the SRY gene is used to produce the SRY protein. Another name for the SRY protein is testes determining factor. Testes determining factor. And so with the presence of the Y chromosome, the SRY gene begins to produce SRY protein or testes determining factor. And this is going to target to that medullary tissue to promote medullary development and suppress cortical development until we begin to point towards the production of the, of the tissue, tissue of the testes from the medullary tissue. So if we had a mouse, an experimental setup, a mouse that is the homogametic sex, XX, and we provide that mouse the SRY gene, that mouse undergoes the production of testes. Now, that's as long as we, we provide the SRY early enough in development that it's not already completely suppressed the um, completely suppressed medullary tissue. So if we still can actually affect the medullary tissue in this mouse during development, that mouse will be programmed now to be a homogametic individual, XX, which would be genetically female, <clears throat> but phenotypically male. So let's talk a little bit more about this SRY. Actually, let's talk about a protein. The SRY protein or testing determining factor. It turns out this is only a switch. And it binds to DNA. And as a DNA binding substrate, it regulates transcription. So it regulates transcription. So we start turning on new genes, and primarily we're doing this in the medullary region of the undifferentiated gonad to change that physiology to begin the progression of development. And so for that very, very rare case where you have a female who is XX and is genetically the homogametic sex, but they have the presence of the SRY gene. And so how might this happen? Well, the SRY gene might actually translocate over on the Y chromosome. Um, and so in dead sperm cells, you have the presence of an X, but the SRY gene is inserted into some other chromosome. This individual has testes that develop and are classified as XX males. And really, these individuals become male, phenotypic. And so it is pretty interesting that a female with an XX and then the SRY gene located on another chromosome can develop as a male. And this would indicate that females have all of the genes for male development. And 
it's going to be the SRY gene that switches on all of these male developmental genes. But this is like super common, right, in, uh, in, in genetics. All of your muscle cells have all of the genetic information required for protein digestion. We just don't turn them on. We leave them turned off because if we turn them on, we start degrading the muscle tissue because the muscle cells are primarily packed full of protein. And so if the SRY gene is not present, we can't turn those genes on. We don't turn those genes on. And so then those, those genes just remain quiescent in the cells as a female goes through development and on into life. Okay, so another side of the equation here is the phenotypic sex. Phenotypic sex. So what you're looking at here in this figure is basically an illustration of the undifferentiated tissues that, that begin to develop. And so you have the gonads with their two layers, cortical and medullary. And then you have these duct systems, and there's actually two different duct systems that begin to develop, the malarian ducts and the wolfian ducts. And you can see that we go through this process of differentiating and digressing each of the different duct systems and each of the different layers of the tissue dependent upon the, the programming for development. And so female and male systems begin to develop. And then we also have the external genitalia that undergo different pathways as well uh, towards the development of the vulva with things like the clitoris and uh, labia minora and majora versus the development of the male uh, external genitalia, the, the glans penis, uh, development of the scrotum to contain the testicular tissue. Okay, so phenotypically, with the production of specific gonadal characteristics, we're going to now drive this phenotypic, um, this phenotypic differentiation as well. differentiation of, uh, of, of the genital ducts is really how phenotypic expression is going to occur here. Um, and we start out here also with undifferentiated tissues. give rise to the fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. But we also have this primordial duct system called the wolfian ducts that begin to develop as well, regardless of the eventual phenotypic sex. Wolfian ducts, when programmed to develop, develop the epididymis, the vas deferens or ductus deferens, seminal vesicles, and connect into the testicular. So basically, the ductwork for females is the malarian system. The ductwork for males is the Wolfian system. And the programming for 
each of these duct systems to develop versus uh, digress is going to be based off of what happens in the go back. Okay? So by default, the Mullerian system is going to begin to develop unless we turn that developmental pathway off. Because the default is always developed. The default is always ovaries and development of the Mullerian system. If the SRY gene is present, then in males, the undifferentiated testy, or I'm sorry, uh, gonad, develops into a test. Actually, progress the medullary tissue to begin to develop a test. Now, as the testes develop, we add another hormone into the mix. So the testes develop because of a hormone called testes determining factor. As the testicular tissue develops, it begins to produce a hormone called Mullerian regression factor. MRF. Goes by a couple other names as well. The vas deferens or ductus deferens and the seminal vesicles. So in male, this our Y gene programs testicular development. Testes begin to produce Mullerian regression factor, MRF also known as Mullerian Mullerian inhibition Mullerian inhibition factor or MIF or anti Mullerian Hormone AMF. So, testicular development, and we begin to produce this hormone Mullerian regression factor. And so, it does exactly what the name suggests, and it targets the Mullerian ducts and begins to cause those to uh, digress. They get reabsorbed into the tissue, and they just are, are removed from the developmental process. We also begin to produce the androgens. And the most potent androgen that's produced in the males from the testicular tissue as it develops is testosterone. Okay? And testosterone is actually going to not only uh, begin to cause uh, changes throughout the organism, but will target to the Wolfian system and begin to progress Wolfian development. So I do have a, a picture here that when the SRY gene is present and we end up with medullary suppression of the cortical region, testes begin to develop. The testes begin to produce malarian regression factor and testosterone. And MRF goes through the process of inducing valerian regression. And so this tissue, even though it had begun to develop, it just gets broken down and reabsorbed. We go through uh, a program apoptotic cell death that removes the valerian system. And testosterone targets the Wolfian ducts. to promote Wolfian system development. So to highlight this, this developmental process going on, uh, I actually want to talk about some experimental data. So in a mammalian model, we have testes that are present, but we do not have Mullerian regression factor. But we 
do have testosterone that's present. What ends up happening here in that scenario? So self tech for some reason ovarian regression factor is inhibited or does not get produced, testosterone is produced, you actually end up with both subsystems. The other scenario is for the testes to be present. Malarian regression factor to be present, the testosterone not present, and this scenario leads towards no duct system. Develops. So both hormones, malarian regression factor and testosterone, are going to be required for the normal development of the male phenotypic sex characteristics. So let me provide now an overall summary of everything that's going on here. Testosterone, yep, both locations. Okay, so summary for male development. Female is default. For the male, starting from the undifferentiated gonad, If the SRY gene is present, you undergo regional development of the medullary tissue to the testicle tissue. Okay, so undifferentiated gonad, SRY gene develops, then we develop testes. Normal testes will then begin to develop and release MRF which leads towards regression of the malarian tissue. We'll also begin to produce testosterone, which leads towards development of the Wolfian tissue. with testosterone, we also now have the ability to add in dihydrotestosterone. And dihydrotestosterone will actually promote development of the external genitalia in the male. Again, the SRY gene is basically a switch that allows testicular development to begin to produce, produce both, both malarian regression factor, which causes the progression of the malarian duct, testosterone, which promotes the development of the Wolfian duct, and also is the precursor to dihydrotestosterone, which then helps the development of the external genitalia.
that the scene has been described. So really the critical factor here is the presence of SRY to help promote all of these other hormones in the tissues target us for progression of the bowel phenotypic characteristics. All right, so I want to take a real quick moment here to talk about why the female I've already alluded to this, but why is female default? And the, the main reason here is because the development occurs in a maternal environment. Development occurs in a maternal environment. And so that means that the fetus is uh, exposed to estrogen. And it turns out that the estrogen is actually needed for female development. But it's also needed for male development. But it just turns out that for male, we have these other hormones that are needed as well. Okay, so the default just the fact that we're in a, a pretty estrogen-rich environment throughout the adult. But if we have the presence of the SRY gene, we have these other hormones that get turned on, and those other hormones will target us towards males. But we actually still are going to utilize estrogen for male development as well. And that's really where I want to lead um, the next. 20 minutes or so, because this is going to come into influence with differentiation of the brain. Differentiation of the brain. Okay, so in the mature adult, Gonadotropin release, LH and FSH, is actually different between the phenotypic sexes. So in the female, gonadotropin release is cyclical. And that cycle, on average, humans is 28 days full survivors. Where in the male, the LH FSH release is constant. So you have cyclical release in females and then in males that constant release is called tonic release. So yes, what that means, ladies, is what you experience for about seven days men are constantly But we constantly have high levels of LH and FSH. And so this here uh, sets up a difference in pituitary function.
difference in male to female pituitary function. Resulting in changes. Normal reproductive processes. So we're going to get through the physiology of it, but I want to start with some experimental data first, kind of work through some experimental data that's going to show how we have come to the consensus that we've come to within the scientific community. So the experimental example, um, I want to take a look first at neonatal male rats, neonatal male rats. So these are newborn male rats. If those newborn male rats are castrated, so this is removal of the testicular tissue, and then are allowed to grow to adulthood. We observe LH and FSH levels in adulthood. These are cyclical, cyclical release of LH and FSH, which is relative. Cyclical release is female. So these started out male, lost the testicular tissue, grow to adulthood, and now they exhibit female patterns of LH and FSH release. The other thing that's kind of interesting here is if we take ovaries from a donor animal and transplant those ovaries into this castrated male rat that's developed with, without testicular tissue since birth, those ovaries will actually cycle normally. So the FSHLH release is actually um, what the, the, an ovary would normally experience in an intact female animal. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. If we take a look at another group of rats, adult mature rats, and these rats post-puberty, post-pubertal rats may undergo castration. LH and FSH remain tonic. They already had established this in, during the pre-pubertal pubertal, pubertal um, time period, right? That's when at, at puberty it becomes noticeably uh, elevated FSH LH levels and it's tonic. Then they get castrated. The tonicity remains. So we still have tonic release. And now if we transplant ovaries, they do not cycle. Do not market normal ovaries. Okay? So, two different experiments. What are the implications? What are the conclusions that we can make based off of this experimental data? The implications are is that the system is programmed early in development. program early in development, and that developmental process that occurs is going to control the pituitary, or set control of the pituitary, that leads to 
release for hormone secretion that produces subsequent gonadal function. And also notice that this programming happens sometime after birth between birth and adult development. So the reproductive systems are actually still under development even after birth. All right, so another set of experimental data this time here to take a look at female rats. If female rats are provided testosterone at a critical period of development. I'm going to put critical kind of in quotes there. Um, so the timing has to be just right, all within this critical period. If we provide testosterone, so this is simply an injection or uh, an implantation of an uh, item that releases testosterone, these females go through their development into, into what are known as acyclic adults. So females normally should have a, cycle, a, a cyclic FSH, LH release. These animals with that injection of testosterone at that crit critical developmental time period, they lose their cyclical release of the gonadotropins become acyclic. So this is known as a androgen sterilization. Androgen sterilization. In addition to that acyclical release of the gonadotropins in adulthood, if we do some phenotypic observations, we would observe that these we would observe that these individuals display male behaviors. And so things like mounting other females. and no display of what's called lordosis, which is in rodent behavior, um, which is a reproductive, it's basically elevating the hindquarters of the animal to expose the external genitalia to competition. So they display male behavior, they actually will mount other females, and they will not display the typical female Lordosis response. All right, another data set back to male rats. If these male rats are castrated, so that we remove. Testosterone source, and again do this during a critical period. The timing is critical here. Um, there's the testosterone source during this critical period. We observe the cyclical FSH and LH. We've already seen that. Now we take it a step further and look at the phenotypic response. These male animals will exhibit female behaviors. They actually will display or have a um, lordosis display, like excessive shopping. 
So, end up with expression uh, or display of lordosis. They don't bump females. Um, that would be called a um, basically a lackluster male sexual response. Okay, so to kind of give you a summary here of the testosterone effects during these critical periods, during these developmental periods. Um, just kind of summarize all of the data here. If we look at neonatal males, if they're allowed to develop normally into adult males, they have male pattern, or what we would define as male pattern, LH and FSH release. And then also will exhibit male behaviors. Whereas if those neonatal rats or individuals are castrated or lose testosterone during a critical period in development and are allowed to develop into adult males. Phenotypically, they're still males, right? Phenotypically, they're still males, but these adult males are feminized. Feminized exhibit female behavior and undergo cyclic FSH LH production. Neonatal males, adult males, normal development, normal male patterns, then this critical period where testosterone is not present, we have this feminization that occurs. On the other side of this experience, does everybody have this over here? On the other side of this experimental data, we would have the neonatal female. It's allowed to develop into a normal adult female. We end up with female behavior and cyclic. FSH LH release. If these neonatal females are provided testosterone during a critical period, that adult is masculinized. masculinized and exhibits male behavior and tonic FSH LH release. Anyways. 